Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of PD and P-Dubs Unscripted. It feels like it's been quite a while, P-Dubs. It has. I mean, with uh, you know us pre-recording well in advance uh, in, in preparation for your mission trips and everything like that, uh, it has been a while since we've been in the studio. Right, and don't adjust your sets if you're watching on YouTube as we're kind of almost twinning today with our colored shirts. Yeah, here. we're in the same color palette, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, it's uh, just the way it is. I, you know, I have a limited wardrobe right. but at least it's not as the, you know at least it's not the same shirt when we started to do the video podcast and it was like the same shirt back to i back. know i know i kept grabbing the same shirt on the podcasting days so that's the one thing i keep in in my mind is like okay don't bring that shirt now after all this time i don't even remember what shirt it was but yeah i don't remember because yeah because we recorded the one with sydney mm -hmm. but then after that we recorded the one with cassandra which came out actually before Forehand. the one with sydney yep yep so I'm all confused yeah, now. I know. So, but uh, we're back. Great to be with everybody again. Thanks for, uh, you know, hanging in there with us. Hopefully you enjoyed the last couple podcasts with uh, those young ladies and hitting some really uh, thought provoking topics. Yeah. Some deep subjects there that a lot of people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I have to say my own daughter, Sydney, really, you know, surprised me so i'm very proud of her and her courageousness to share personal things like that and same with uh, cassandra as well right and i was just trying to look because i believe that you know we do have now uh over five thousand listens of our podcast wow wow that's S something yeah i know really Man, five thousand five thousand so that's a pretty that's big, almost a thing yeah almost yeah. i don't know like because I know I was talking to Andy, who kind of get it all set up, all this stuff. He's like, yeah, because we were talking about something. He's like, 5,000? I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. In a, but for, I mean, a small podcast, which is what I would assume we uh, are. Yeah, we have to be, like, so small market, right? Right. You know, because we spend so much money to pr get promotional about our podcast. <laughs> but, you know, we're grateful for everybody that listens. Kind of what we talked about on our 100th episode that came out a couple months ago. Yeah. But, you know, it's been a great time. And that's, I was like, 5,000, that feels like a milestone yeah. listening to. Especially when we tried sponsorship and so, and one of our sponsors thought that we were looking for money. I know. And we were just they having, were pretty reluctant. <laughs> right. We were just having fun with the idea. I said, like, oh, it's sponsored by yeah. without telling them by that yeah. when they were sponsoring. <laughs> But, uh, anyway. but yeah, but we thought a good topic would be kind of the reason why we didn't record last week because we were both up at Delavan, Wisconsin for our past Northern Illinois Pastoral Conference General, is that the General, General Conference. Conference, yeah. And we had a great topic from uh, Dwight, I believe. Yes, and I, from Ambassadors of Reconciliation. Right, right. And you know who couldn't learn more about reconciliation because people at conflict. That happens all the time. It's in every relationship, every relationship that we have. Right. And so, you know, and I had a laugh because I was telling P-Dubs that I, we did an office episode in my elective yesterday of when it's conflict resolution. So I brought some of this in and, you know, that's kind of what I was saying when Dwight was talking. There's part of it where Michael Scott, the boss at Thunder Myth in the office is like, well, here's the options that we have to settle this conflict. There's win-lose win and then something something and then they're like we'll just skip to the end where we all win he's like well that would be option four but option five is win 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 where i as the mediator win because i successfully mediated this ah, conflict okay so it's just one of those silliness and then like at one point they're like well that would be a compromise and we agreed for win 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 yeah yeah <laughs> but so that reconciliation you see is needed so greatly and those such a great topic and a lot of good stuff that Dwight brought to us. You know, speaking of shows like that, um, I was watching Everybody Loves Raymond and there was an episode where, um, you know, the Barones were meeting Emily's family for the first time and there and was his all... brothers. Yeah, uh, Robert's, uh, you know... Fiance. Fiance at the time, Amy. And uh, a big brouhaha broke out amongst, you know, the two families, particularly you know frank and amy's father and uh and and it's just they were like oil and water and uh ray's wife deb always tries to like analyze things and and apply you know psychological things and 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 steps in and and she's like you know 
we, you know, here's what we need to do. We need to, you know, work on coming together and, and Ray's like, oh no, there she goes again. She's getting involved. Don't get involved. No. <laughs> and so like she does and it gets worse. And so Ray's like, I'm out of here. And he leaves. And then uh, Amy's brother, Peter, who's, who's kind of an odd duck comes out and he likes Ray and he's, and he goes, well, Ray, you know, I know you don't want this marriage to happen. Let Let's you and I, you know, work together. And he goes, wait a minute, Peter, I didn't say that. And he goes, well, then then I'm going to do it on my own. And he goes back in there and Ray goes, oh, man, I'm going to have to get involved. <laughs> and so he ends up getting involved. And finally, by what he says and appeals to Amy, he brings them all together. Nice. And so it was it was like at least at minimum, Robert and Amy like made up. And they just left and left the families to kind of stew with themselves, which I don't think they ever really kind of resolved. <laughs> was Garvin in the episode? Garvin, I don't know. No, no. Do you wasn't. know who Garvin is? No. You also know him as Uncle Leo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Hooray>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Uncle Leo. He's simultaneously the same character on Seinfeld as he is on Ray Barone, but he has different names. Right, but is he, he's not Uncle Leo. No, no, he's it's Garvin. Garvin on he's Ray. On, he's nine episodes, and oh, everybody loves Raymond. Man, so there. Now that you mention it, the, the other episode I watched was Ray got to go to the the what is it the the lodge with with Frank, and they go to a steam room where they're sitting in towels, and Ray walks in, and there's Garvin. Ray. <laughs> what is the same? Well, it's funny. Like, I know how much you love him as Uncle Leo. Oh man, yeah. There's only 14 episodes with Uncle Leo. That's it. Out of how many episodes of uh, Seinfeld are there? Like a thousand. Who knows? <laughs> 173. Oh, so man. he's not in many of them. But that's I think speaks to the greatness Uncle of both Leo. those shows. That little minor characters like that have such an impact. Oh yeah. When he when when uh, now I'm getting my. So. Shows mix up when uh, Jerry rats out Uncle Leo in the bookstore for stealing, and, and he goes, "Hello," because <laughs> he didn't say hello to him before. Oh, oh sorry, my. I derailed that one. Yeah, but I was that's like, all right. That was perfect. But I was like, I can't pass that opp- opportunity to bring up Uncle Leo. <laughs> I forgot that was his name. And uh, uh, see, I wouldn't have known. I had to look it up. That's what I was Raymond. looking up because I know he's in the episode I've used in my elective when Ray doesn't want to go to church. Oh yeah, and yeah. then. He finally goes and he sees his dad has the cushy life as he calls as being an usher where they just sit in the back and do nothing. Yeah. And Uncle Leo, aka Garvin, is one of the guys in the back. So you want to be an usher? There's a waiting list to get on. There's a waiting list. Oh, Oh. man. That's great. But yeah. Yeah. So ambassadors for reconciliation, uh, ambassadors of of reconciliation is the group. uh, It's an LCMS group that uh, has been around for a number of years. And in this uh, first publication that our leader took us through uh, was published in 2016. So, um, you know, they've been around a while, but uh, certainly based upon what we've learned, they're, um, unfortunately, and sad to say, they're busy. Right. right? Like they're going from church to church to Something church. You said like over 100 places that in he's the going? past year, yeah. That's insane. Yeah, that really says kind of where we're getting at, that this is pervasive and necessary in in every church, right. you know, And it's like you said, it's in every relationship, whether it's mm-hmm. spouses, friends, family members of different ilk, whatever, brother, sister. Mm-hmm. There's always... Even the God. Even the God. And that's where, like, as we kind of jump into this discussion... That's kind of on the front page, or maybe I'll try to put this image on the podcast, yeah. on the video, where it is like the whole, like I have a little pamphlet, Pastor has the book here, because mm-hmm. neither we didn't both have them both, so we're sharing our resources here. But the little pamphlet I'm looking at says, Proclaiming God's Forgiveness, Go and Be Reconciled. What does this mean? Mm-hmm. And they have a cross on there with the nice Luther Rose right in the center. Yeah, yeah. But so, and and they talked about that at the conference that it's not just when we think of reconciliation, it's that vertical relationship mm-hmm. with God and that horizontal relationship with another person. And that's where it makes that perfect cross where, like, you have the vertical part of the cross, which is our relationship with God, and that horizontal is our relationship with other people. Yeah. And, and it really gets to what our Lord Jesus Christ answered to the man who said, What is the greatest commandment, teacher? 
And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So like love is right in the middle, and he is he is the personification of love. Right. right. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's perfect um, visual of the cross. Right. And so I don't know if we want to start with that, to be reconciled with God part, which yeah, is that. Yeah, there, there are three topics, right? Yeah, for each of these. Mm-hmm. So the be reconciled with God. I'll just run through all three, then we'll break them down a little bit each. Yeah. For to be reconciled with God, it's remember whose we are, repent before God, receive God's forgiveness. And then to be reconciled to others, it is to confess to the other person, forgive as God forgave you, and restore with gentleness. Right. So starting with that, remember whose we are. Yeah. And that is we are gods. Like, yeah. And that's where they talked a lot about our baptism. That through our baptism, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We share God's name through our baptisms. Yeah, it gets right down to our own identity right. in, in the Lord. And uh, one of the first um, scripture verses that he brought up was from 1 John 3, uh, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And mm-hmm. yeah, we have to remember we belong to God. Right. We are his. And it's sadly easily forgotten. Like we mm-hmm. think of, you know, our egos get in the way. So we think of me as an individual. Like yeah. me, I think of me as Donald. I need to be the best or need to have whatever is coming to me. Mm-hmm. But when you realize you're a child of God and that our name is Christ, that we're Christians, we kind of have to step back and be like, okay, I need to make sure I'm glorifying God in what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense, like you know, uh, I'm I don't know about you, but it sounds like things that you shared about your parents and the way you were brought up. But like, you know, I remember my parents. Well, if you're a shilf, you're going to do this, you know. And one of them was eat my vegetables, which I didn't do, and I thought, well, maybe I'm not a shilf. Right. And so, but it kind of went the other way in my mind. But but like, you know, this is how we carry ourselves. This is how people know who we are. You know, right. so like. Um, you know, if you're an Antor, right. you're going to talk to your mom every day. Right. Right? <laughs> like, you know? right. Or even like, I think about like working at Jewel. Yeah. Cause I have two older brothers mm. that worked yeah. at Jewel. So that was an easy in for me because like they set the good example of being hard workers and stuff. Yep. So they're like, Oh, you're an Antor. We know you're going to be a good worker. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I know I was blessed in a sense in that regard that, you know, my bosses looked ho- highly upon me because of that last name, yeah. knowing I come from, you know, the Antor, good stock, good stock, you know, those yeah. Antor boys, they worked their way up in the jewel family. And then I had to, you know, break the trend there and go a completely <laughs> different way. Yeah. Well. But even like where we've seen that connection with partnering with the local jewels here in Palatine, where it's like, Oh, we know your family. Mm-hmm. So we'll help you guys out and look out for you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, uh, it, it's so important. Uh, remember whose you are. And, uh, you know, like we're of good stock. We're of the best stock of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, um, so, uh, as you say, so often our own pride and ego tries to, um, elevate itself beyond, uh, remembering who we are. Right. And I think when we put that, like remembering who we are almost puts us on equal footing with that other person Mm -hmm. where I'm not like pushing myself up like you know we've talked about i think probably gathering players or something and it'll be hard to demonstrate here the certain nba player that at times has had the celebration where he's like putting his hands down oh like, yeah like lowering or even now i think that's pat bev has done the too small yeah and it's like you're trying to push somebody below you but when we remember we're all from god and that's who's we are we are equals and so we're not trying to get one up on somebody yeah, and, and exactly, not elevating yourself more than you should. And that kind of goes to, like, who are we by our own nature? And that was an area uh, that uh, Dwight brought up. He's like, uh, by nature, I am a sinful creature. And he backs all this up with Scripture. I, uh, by nature, I am an enemy of God. By nature, I'm one who daily struggles with my sinful nature, uh, by nature, I am unclean and worthless, a beggar who has nothing to offer God. And lastly, by nature, I am condemned to be separated from God eternally, based on Romans six twenty three. Yeah. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's like 
yes, we want to gravitate and say, yeah, I'm a child of God, you know, and I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm this and I'm free. It's all gospel. But where did you come from? Like, what was your starting point? You know? And, uh, so this develops the absolute need of remembering who you are in Christ Jesus. And, uh, so through in Christ, he says, we're a new creature through him. In baptism, we're changed from enemy to heir. I like that. You right. know, not just, um, you know, acquaintance. Um, we're a beloved child of God, precious in his eyes. And we're cleansed and ransomed by the precious blood of Christ. And we're no longer separated from God, for I have been brought near by his blood. So. Oh. That's like, I like that, those two sides. Like, here's the here's who we are by our own sinful nature, but here's what Jesus does for us. Right. And that kind of, I think, leads into that next part of the cross mm-hmm. going down on the vertical relationship, which is repent before God. Yes. Where we confess our sinfulness. And part of that repentance is, to me, I always think of making that U-turn. You're going right towards that sin, but when you, when you repent, you're like, I'm sorry, I'm going to go the complete opposite way and run to our Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. And that's that hard part is making that U-turn and turning away from that sin because we want to keep gravitating towards that, but repentance requires us to go the opposite way. Yeah, and I think a lot of times repentance in just talking among people might get the idea that repentance is completely the act of the person, when in actuality it is the Holy Spirit. It's part of our confession in the third article. Uh, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or senses believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, sanctified uh, me in faith, and keeps me in the one true faith. So it's like it's the Spirit's calling through the gospel that causes us to say, oh, I am going the wrong way. Right. And and by his call, it it is the very agent that turns us around. Because left on our own, I th- I know me. I'd be like fat, dumb, and happy, just you know, I'm just living my life, you know, um, you know, doing stupid stuff. And you know, and that's the thing is, like, the devil gets us thinking, "What we're doing? Oh, we're enjoying this." When in actuality, we shouldn't be doing those things, and we mm-hmm. don't realize the destruction that it's causing. Right. And he tempts us with things that are going to be pleasing to our human nature. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, to repent before God. Now, now that word before kind of grabs me a little bit like it's you know the old phrase we're gonna have a come to jesus meeting (laughs) like or like like when you did something wrong as a kid and you had to come before your parents maybe maybe your dad was the the authority or maybe it was your mom and and you just like the thought of having to explain yourself to one of your parents your mom or your dad or both just kind of was a, a, a a most frightening thing and and it, it it kind of got you to the point of like, oh man, I I really screwed up. Now I have to tell mom and dad. Right. And nobody, as a kid, wanted to do that if they knew they did something wrong. Right. I even think of like like a court setting, like yeah. coming for a judge. Like, no, I've got a few speeding tickets over mm-hmm. the years. And I remember the one time when I was in seminary having to go to court for my speeding ticket, but going before the judge and like, you know, I had no, I was dead to rights. I know I was speeding. And it's like that giving and that account, which is intimidating and scary. Yeah. And that also made me think of like Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will have to give an account of himself to God. So that's always one of those like scary, like, I don't want to have to recount all my sins to God. Mm -hmm. But then I always think of that as like a courtroom setting. I'm like, does Jesus just come up and be like, nope, stop. Those sins, all those things that he did, they're no more. That's why I went to the cross. Yeah, and the relief that one would have over that pardon, right? Like, you know, you you, you gave a great analogy of like, as you were talking, I'm imagining the courtroom setting, and the judge is in his robe, right? right. And he's flanked by officers and a court reporter, and, and he's elevated in this big chair. Down. And you're down, you're nothing. Like, and and... You know, when I've stood before a judge for a traffic ticket, or th- I think that's about all that I've had to stand before him <laughs> okay. for, <laughs> just going? recalling my life here. Um, I've I've also been in courtrooms where I've watched, you know, people, and you quickly realize because of your actions, 
You have lost control of your future. You're not a person, not in the position of power. No. And all of that, which I just described, kind of makes you really realize that when you come before the judge or you come before God, who is judge, right? right? But he's also judge and savior. Right. So it's amazing. See, I don't know what that will look like when we have to give account before God. What it's, it reminds me of this: repent before God. Mm-hmm. And it's not like oh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say sorry, God, and just kind of keep on my way. It, it to me it connotes a a face to face. Like right. who I have to come before my Maker. Right. That's that's and, serious. And let's be honest: we really have no good excuse for any of the sins that we ever commit. Mm-mm. Especially when we if there's a sin you struggle with, it's like you have no good right. excuse for that. And think of think of someone who's standing before a judge. They might try and self-justify themselves or worm their way out of it because the judge doesn't know everything. Right. But God does. So like you come before God and he's like, don't go there. You're not going to say that, are you? Right. Uh, I wouldn't try to worm you. Okay, there's no way out. Well, kind of like a certain manager on the north side arguing a check swing and gets ejected from the umpire, you know. Oh. Well, you know. Oh, don't don't get us spinning down the rabbit hole here, <laughs> my fella. <laughs> but yeah, so that idea of coming before and that repentance is true repentance of like yeah. God knows like you can't just say as you're saying, like, oh I'm sorry. God knows if it's like the not legitimately not really feeling it. Well just as like if we talk to an individual, we can tell when they're truly sorry for their actions. Yeah, and there's contrition. Yeah, it's not just like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, and keep on going. But it's like, hey, man, I am really sorry. And, th- and that, speaking of contrition, that's the verse, Psalm 51, 17, that um, ambassadors in Christ of, of, reconciliation. of reconciliation come and say, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So, you know, God's not looking for a self-justifying spirit or heart. He's he's like, I can work with a broken spirit and a broken heart and create a new spirit within him. Right, and that's when I was trying to look at my notes, but I don't think I have it, but where he talked about, like, breaking a horse. Yeah. Where you're not, like, hurting it, but you're just breaking it so that it will submit. submit. Yep. Yes, that was a great analogy, a great analogy. And... uh so from that came this whole discussion about idolatry and mm. how idols are developed. And I think that's in the middle of your pamphlet. Right. And he had this awesome graph of like a downward arrow and it said the development of an idol. And it, it mm. starts with uh, fear, desire, and trust. And then there is a demand and then unmet expectations now you're spiraling downward into frustrations and then judge and then punish with the end result is a destruction or death. But you have a neat um, uh, display of how that kind of gets, what what brings it out of that death oh, spiral. Oh, so you're talking about the repentance yeah. is the cure? Yeah. So yeah, so it's, and I'll try to put this in the video as well. So sorry for those just listening to the audio. But you have the start of the repentance is a cure kind of arrow, and you have fear, desire, trust. And as you start seeing that downward where it gets to demand and that unmet expectations and the fr- frustration is instead of that frustration is kind of like that fork in the road mm. where you can either take the descent or you could trend upwards. And that's where he says repentance comes in is, towards that frustration is ah. you could either respond with, repentance or you can just spiral down into judge punish and the end result death or destruction gotcha yeah so so there there is a way out of the death spiral and right. that's that's repentance and a lot of people think oh repentance is just like a churchy word well it kind of is but it's all in scripture right i mean jesus well, even, calls us to that we even think of our own life with sin like if there's no repentance we would end up in destruction and death. Mm-hmm. But with repentance, we go up, and you know, typically people think of heaven up, so that repentance leads upwards towards heaven. Yeah. So, so that's that's what's necessary 
to change the trajectory of yourself when you come before God and, and repent, because God is calling you through his spirit to repent, and uh, that gives you a new trajectory. And finally, from that new trajectory, you receive something amazing, and that's the third leg of the being reconciled to God, and that's you receive God, God's forgiveness. Right, and that takes that burden off of our shoulders mm-hmm. because, yes, it's important to be forgiven by others, but other people on this in our horizontal relationship can't condemn us or send us to hell for all eternity. Mm-hmm. Only God can. So if we don't have that forgiveness, that's that death outcome and destruction outcome is the descent in a sense into hell. And that's where repentance comes in, where it changes that trajectory, where we realize and I think that's the one thing with receiving God's forgiveness and even receiving it from others and extending is like, sometimes we almost make it that it's not a big deal. Like, mm-hmm. oh, like somebody wrongs you. Oh, it's okay. It's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can't like, you know, and people say, I'm so sorry I did that. That's okay. You're really not helping them change right. behavioral. And you're not maybe healing that hurt that's inside of you because mm-hmm. you're just kind of like, oh. Pushing well, it under the rug. Right. Because it'll, it'll come up mm-hmm. under the rug again. Right. If you don't address it. And uh, so so uh, the verse they use is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, uh, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is so great to hear and let it sink into our heart that God is faithful and just and will cleanse. Right. Um, so that's that's the, the eternal aspect, kind of what you're talking about when... When we come before God and 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 speak our sins, confess them to Him, um, He's He's the faithful one, in, even in the midst of our unfaithfulness. It's right. incredible, right? And I was just doing a confirmation makeup with somebody. We watched a video clip from Francis Chan, and at the end, he kind of says, "You know, even when we're faithless, God is faithful." Yeah. Wow. And uh, Paul even said, "You know, while you were still dead in your trespasses." Christ came and saved right. you. He didn't wait for us to figure ourselves out. Yeah, otherwise we'd still be waiting for that Savior. Yeah, and the the one part of this, and it maybe probably relates more to the re- forgiveness with each other, is the words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. And like, what a great teaching Jesus gave to us right there. Um, he wasn't just saying that for the people who put him on the cross at, at that moment and location, but he... He said that to you and I, like, because right. half the time we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, we don't realize until it's too late. Like the hurt we're causing. Right. Right. So yeah. uh, there you go. Uh, the vertical aspect, be reconciled to God, is remember who you are, whose you are. Got to get the right grammar there. I know somebody, there's somebody's listening. I know, but there's that person. Grammarians. I know, but that grammarian is very proud of you earlier today. today. I got one. And then repent before God and receive God's forgiveness. So now. Let's go to the horizontal aspect. We're confessed to the other person, which that is not necessarily an easy thing because then you have to acknowledge that you messed up, you Mm -hmm. hurt somebody. And that isn't always easy because we don't want to make that acknowledgement. We want to just think, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. That person is the one who, you know, they just took it out of context or I don't know why they're so hurt by that. And I think a lot of times people will look at this first one and say, Hey, I brought it before God. I'm good with God. I'm I'm fine. I don't need to go this next step. That is like the biggest tra- trap, right. right? Like God didn't call us to just come before him. He tells us to confess to one another. Well, that's where I, I don't think it's on your page here, but on this little pamphlet right underneath the cross, it has James 5, 16a, therefore confess your sins to one another. So even James mm. is encouraging us in scripture yeah. to confess to one another. Right. our sins. Mm-hmm. So it isn't like the Bible just says confess to God. It's pretty clear we need to confess to one another our sins. Yeah, because the the damage that has been done um, exists in our relationships with one another right. as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that's a lot of the times we forget, like, back to that whose we are. Not only whose you are, but whose... The, who that person also belongs to. They too belong to Jesus right. and the Father. So 
it's not just a myopic thing of like, oh, yeah, I got to remember who I am. But they too. So right. when we treat someone who is a brother and sister in Christ with contempt, what are we saying about right. what God thinks about them? Well, I think in the Gospels, maybe this is more to Jesus, but I don't think it is. Like where it's like Jesus is talking like, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. Mm-hmm. And like, well, why didn't you see that? What you did for the least of these, you were doing to me. And I kind of think of the same way here. Like when we sin against somebody, we're doing that. It's like we're doing that to God. Mm-hmm. We're sinning against God in that regard. Yeah. He's in there. He's in that person. Right. Just as he's in us. So, yeah. So uh, to be reconciled to others, confess to the other person. And uh, so, um, yeah, they kind of talked about like, how does sin affect, how do my sins affect others? Um, you know, when we sin against God, we usually sin against others. These offenses harm our relationship with those we hurt. Our sins also affect others directly and indirectly. How we treat one another affects our witness to Christ and our faith in the forgiveness of sins. And that's a that's a good reminder as well. Right. I think that witness of Christ, like I think of that example you hear, like you know, I've shared before, where it's like, you know, you have the "I belong to such and such a church" on your bumper sticker, but then you can f- like cut somebody off, or your yeah. they can see you getting angry, giving maybe yeah, give hand them the high or, sign, or, yeah, yeah, or you can. It's like, what type of witness are we giving mm-hmm. to our Christian faith when? We act like that. I think you're really onto something. Not only uh, what kind of witness are we giving to our faith, but like, yeah, that witness to people who aren't even Christians. Like, <laughs> like, well, what? Why? Why would I want to be like that person? They're, you know, no what, different. Yeah, they're not living in the supposed God's yeah, love, and they're a bunch eh. of hypocrites. Right. Yeah. But yet we do that. Right. I mean, all of us. I, I mean, so um, that that is uh, that's really. Yeah, we don't like, thing. and that's the thing is like in anything that we do, we don't want anything of that we do in our life to be a hindrance to somebody in their faith. Mm-hmm. We don't want to be that stumbling block based on our actions. Well, and kind of where you're going, like you know, cause somebody cuts you off, you know, you get angry, and you you know, you use the high signs or whatever, you honk the horn or whatever. And so, you know, we in this exercise, they talked about what are the dangers of anger, and I think. You know, we're all prone to have um, issues with anger, and uh, and I liked what they laid out here. Anger may lead to losing our temper by saying hurtful things that bring harm and not healing, Ephesians 4.29. Also, grieving the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. It also brings about resentment or grudges, Ephesians 4.31. I think we're getting an idea to go into Ephesians 4, right? Right. Um, and then unkind, harsh, and forgiving attitudes and actions, Ephesians 4.32. And he says, there are times when anger may be appropriate response. In fact, people often speak of, quote, righteous anger. And we did kind of talk about that. Right. But certainly our God disproves of sinful activity and expresses his anger at sinful behavior. But God also knows how perfectly, uh, how to perfectly control anger, not us. So, yeah, a lot of, like, stuff about anger in there, which I think is completely relatable. Right. I think, you know, that's where that, when somebody wrongs you, that's where that anger can come in. And you're like, well, they did this to me, so I need to get even. And I think that's where Satan is kind of sitting, crouching at the door, like, ready to pull the trigger on your anger. Because he knows, like, when someone gets angry, it's an explosion. Right. And now it's a mess. And, you know, now you're like... All that you can focus on is just the utter mess before you. Right, and trying to put it back together, Mm -hmm. which is why we confess to that other person to say, hey, I know I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that leads into the next hard thing, forgive as God forgives you. Yeah. Because that's the next step in this like horizontal part of forgiveness is that forgiving. Because, you know, whatever we do to harm somebody or wrong somebody, We've, that pales in the times that we wrong God by our sins because mm-hmm. we sin daily against God. I don't think we sin every day against people in our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's the second use of the law, the whole mirror aspect right. that you know Luther talked about. Like looking at yourself in the mirror is not fun. 
because you know like you see your own how you're aging or how you look and nobody's like ever totally pleased with their appearance but like to look at yourself and see i am a sinful human being and um that i see myself as a sinner but god forgave me how can i not forgive my brother and sister right you know or anyone you right. know and i mean scripture even speaks that like if you know if you don't forgive your brother you know i won't forgive you type deal mm-hmm. stuff yeah yeah and that's a hard thing to think about like well if i withhold forgiveness from somebody is god going to withhold forgiveness from me because i don't want that because of you know i think of romans six twenty three for the wages of sin is death that is just one sin he's saying there is death so if i just don't forgive one person and i don't have one of my sins forgiven that's not a good mm-hmm. outlook. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of like, you know, forgiving someone um, who has wronged you, it requires like what Paul talks about, like what kind of clothes are you wearing? Like what are you putting on? You know, d- take off anger, malice, uh, you know, slander, all those things. Take them off. Put them to death, actually, right. is part of what he's saying. But then he says, clothe yourself in Colossians 3.12 with, and, and, and clothe yourself, number one, remember whose you are as God's chosen ones. You are holy and beloved by God and clothe yourself with compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And like, man, when you start to like live that out, these are powerful right. reminders from our, our God. Well, going back to that Ephesians chapter four, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Yeah. Yeah. Be tender hearted, be, be gentle and of good nature. Um, you know, um, Because someday you're going to be on the other end of the stick. Right. You know, so if you're like harsh to someone, it's kind of like, um, you know, the the parable of the man who owed debts. Right. And he got got like this enormous debt forgiven. And then he goes out and he goes and puts the guy in a chokehold who owes him hardly anything. Right. And throws him into jail. So like, you're going to be on the other end of that stick someday. Right. Don't you want some of that like cooperation Mm -hmm. or like forgiveness? Yeah. So, yeah, remembering how God has forgiven you, he's forgiven you completely. Right. And uh, so he calls us to a high standard of measuring that level of forgiveness with our fellow uh, human beings. Right, which then leads to that final one, restore with gentleness. Mm-hmm. Which is, that's the hard part there is that gentleness. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, our sinful human nature, like, well, I don't want to be gentle. I almost want to rub it in, in a right. so to speak. Like, I want one more opportunity. One more to little dig. dig. And uh, I want to get my point across so that I know that I said everything I needed to say and I'm right. You know, but that what does that get you? Right. Like, I think of when I was in seminary doing flag football and, like, we had some crazy rules in flag football. And I get it. It stinks being a referee. I yeah. hated it when I had to do that stuff in seminary. But I remember one game, like, they shoved our quarterback to the ground, mm. and they didn't call a flag. And I'm like, it's flag football. Nobody should really be shoved to the ground. <laughs> that should be a penalty. Yeah. And I remember the ref kind of saying, well, it doesn't matter. You're not going to win because we were getting smoked. I mean, yeah, we weren't going to win the game. Yeah. And so, you know, at the end, we were doing the handshakes and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, good job reffing today or something sarcastically back. So, yeah. you no, know, not very gentle. You got your it last Got dig. my little dig in. And then yeah. we kind of talked about And maybe that's when he said that you weren't going to win comment. But I was just like, yeah, that wasn't really gentle. But it was that frustration and mm-hmm. taking that out, not being very tender hearted. Right, right. But, you know, that gentleness. Yeah, when you're in the midst of feeling wronged. It's not easy to be gentle. You want that last little dig. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it was definitely a sarcastic, like, good job roughing. Yeah. Yeah, so to restore uh, a person, and this is a great reminder, too, Galatians 6.1. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you be tempted. There's that other side of the coin, right? Right. And so, 
you know, gentleness, I think maybe in, from a worldly viewpoint, feels like, oh, you're a pushover. You're getting run over. You're gentle, you know. And it's almost mocked. And, I mean, I've seen that even in Christian circles. Like, oh, that person's so gentle. You know, they got to stand firm on their own two feet. Hmm. And it's like, well, this gentleness is exuding the love of Christ to a fellow brother and sister um, so that they can be restored in Christ right? and relationally with you. And like going back to what we talked about a little bit ago, like isn't that what you would want from somebody if you were the one who did the wronging of somebody mm-hmm. else? You'd want them to be gentle in that restoration. Right, right. And it doesn't mean that in gentleness you're condoning their, their actions. Right. Or that you're going to maybe let your guard down of saying like, oh, I'm just going to treat them like, you know, depending on what the hurt, the degree of the hurt is. Because, yeah, I get that there might be that, like, a serious hurt where, like, okay, my trust of that person is not going to be where it was at, Mm -hmm. but I can still be gentle in my forgiveness, but I'm not going to set myself up to be hurt again in that way. Right, right. And it's that fine balancing act. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and then uh, in, in what does it mean to restore uh, ambassadors of reconciliation? Say, using words from Galatians 6, 1 and 2, who is the one that needs to be restored? Who is the one that is called to restore? Other passages also teach to help others who need restoration. And, and it goes in the following text of Matthew eighteen fifteen, Philippians 4, 2 and 3, James 5, 19 and 20. So... You know, it's just asking the questions. Who is the one who needs to be restored? Who is called to restore? And um, yeah, that word caught in, uh, he kind of goes off into that word caught in Galatians 6 1 can have different meanings. But in the original sense, it's, aha, I caught you in the act. Mm. That's the, f- the nature of the original word. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading this wrong, so I'm going too quick. The original Greek word is translated caught. That does not have this does not have the sense I aha, I caught you in the act. Rather, caught means one who is entangled with sin. I like that even better. Like you're all wrapped up in it, you can't find your way out. Right. Like I can think of like that like human knot game sometimes you do as like an icebreaker. Mm, yeah, right. Where you just gotta work together to untangle everybody. Yeah. So uh we're all entangled in our sins and uh and so forth. So, yeah, uh, hopefully all of that leads to reconciliation. And, you know, reconciliation from God comes through his Lord's Supper, through his forgiveness, his grace. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's God's ultimate end goal is reconciliation. But I do remember Dwight saying that, you know, there, there are instances where sometimes reconciliation isn't a uh, option because of maybe abuse right maybe you have to go your separate ways Mm -hmm. like you know like a physical abuse kind of thing or something emotional emotional abuse and uh so but but you know you it doesn't mean you don't try to work at that maybe you just come to a point where it's like like you said this is like the end point this is the end end point point. you know i i forgive you uh, because lack of forgiveness just entangles us even more right and like you know if you get to that point it's like okay we don't have to be buddy buddy, hang out. Mm-hmm. But if we see each other, be cordial mm-hmm. and just let bygones be bygones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully uh, this has been helpful for uh, you, our listeners. And uh, Pastor said he'll put up some of the graphics and that. And uh, but uh, we know that it was helpful for us as pastors, and and we hope to employ some of these things in our daily lives as we minister to to people among us. Yeah, so thank you everybody for listening. God's blessings. 